Hello and welcome everybody. We just wait uh, one more minute, maybe until everybody is inside, because it takes some time for everybody to join us tonight. Okay, then I start. Hello and welcome to the fourth part of our series, Women Take on the Digital Divide. I'm delighted that we are discussing computer vision today, especially since it seems to be the one fits all solution if you are in a privileged position. If not, data shows how bias and discrimination oftentimes is made worse by computer vision. I'm even more delighted that we could win Timnit Gebro for this endeavor. From my side, already a big thank you to you. My name is Francesca Schmidt. I'm the Senior Program Officer for Feminist Digital Policy in the Gunnar Werner Institute for Feminism and Gender Democracy at the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Berlin, in Germany. We, as the Gunnar Werner Institute, have been working on feminist digital policy since 2014, and in this sense also on questions about algorithm, surveillance and data feminism. I want to take this opportunity to thank my cooperation partner, Nakima Steffelbauer from Fraunloop, without whom this event and even the event series as a whole could not, have, uh, could not take place today. Nakima is the founder of Fraunloop, a non-profit organization funded, uh, founded to expand the number of qualified women entering the tech industry. And since we don't have so much time today, I'll pass the mic to Nakima, who will introduce our speaker today. Nakima, the floor is yours. Thanks, Francesca. I will be very quick and uh, just say how excited I am and how happy I am to welcome Dr. Timnit Gebru. Um, Dr. Gebru has been featured most recently in the documentary, The Coded Bias, um, with Joy Bulamwini. She is a recent recipient of the EFF Foundation uh, Pioneer Award. She is a distinguished PhD scholar from Stanford University and a co-founder of Black in AI. And she's also one of the subjects of a recent children's coloring book titled 100 Women, 100 Immigrant Women Who Changed the World. Um, that will no doubt inspire a whole generation of young people uh, to consider the sciences. So thank you very much uh, for attending and welcome Dr. Gebru. Thanks so much for having me. Um, let me see, I'm going to share my screen. And I want to change this setting so I see other people except my, my, myself, like I see my face right now. <laughs> uh, let's, okay, good. Um, so, um, hi everyone, thank you so much for having me um, this evening. Um, so, what I wanted to do, what I thought maybe I could do is um, talk a little bit about computer vision um, and um, some of the consequences that, um, like, that I've seen at least within the U.S. mostly, um, and then maybe take some questions after. And if you have, if you have questions throughout my talk, like, feel free to write it on the chat so that I can I can see the the questions. As I'm going, I might ask you some questions too um, along the way. So, um, okay. So, um, the the first thing I wanted to do was um, uh, Emily Denton in my uh, in our team at Google. Uh, so I I ran a team called the um, Ethical AI team. Uh, it's a research team with my co lead Meg Mitchell. And so Emily Denton is a researcher who also worked in computer vision, and I um, gave a similar lecture at Stanford at one of the classes I used to TA. And so one of the things we asked them was, we asked people, you know, uh, what are, where do you think computer vision is being used most for today? And the, <laughs> we wanted to start with this question because I was worried that I don't even know the answer to this question, right? So here I am as a researcher working in this field, and I don't even really know the answer to this question. And then the second question we asked was, where do you think the greatest positive potential for, of computer technologies lies? And then where the, neg the opposite, where the negative potential lies. And so 
So we gave some options that, you know, where do you think this technology is used for most for today? A lot of people said, you know, personal convenience and stuff. Um, and then um, I, I'm looking at the chat a little bit. And then um, also, I think there's something wrong with the um, labels here. But um, also, uh, there was this was, I think, military and policing applications. There's something about health healthcare, uh, like, for example, automat automated melanoma detection here, self-driving cars. A lot of people think that um, this is being used for self-driving cars. Um, and then where do you think the greatest positive potential computer vision technology lies? I think a lot of people said healthcare, some a lot of and self-driving cars. And then the other question, where do you think the greatest negative potential lies? Um, I believe this is policing and military applications, and I don't re really remember which ones. It's probably like healthcare too. Um, and so one of the things, one of the reasons we wanted to do this exercise was, first of all, do researchers entering this field with their hopes and dreams of trying to like make the world better or anything like that understand what it's being used for? And then secondly, um, people's perspectives about what what the future holds in terms of technology um, is very dependent on what, on what their experiences are. So here is an example. So uh, the potential of AI, this is from an excerpt from James Landay's um, a piece called the Smart, Inter Smart Interfaces for Human-Centered AI. And in this piece, he says, imagine for a moment that you're in an office, hard at work, but it's no ordinary office. By observing cues like your posture, tone of voice, and breathing patterns, it can sense your mood and tailor the lighting and sound accordingly. Through gradual ambient shifts, the space around you can take the edge off when you're stressed or boost your creativity when, you're, when you hit a lull. Imagine further that you're a designer using tools with equally perceptive abilities. At each step in the process, they riff on your ideas based on their knowledge of your own creative persona, contrasted with features from the best work of others. So this is an imagination of the future uh, of an office that has lots of sensors, and they're all sort of catering to you, right? They're just trying to make you feel better. Like you're tired, like you're hit a lull, you're not creative, Let, let's help you be more creative. Um, you're, you're not feeling great. Let's 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 dim the lights a little bit, or let's change the lighting so you feel great. So this is this is the perspective of technology really being at your disposal to to like uh, to help you out to augment your abilities. And then here is the same office, uh, the same setup. Um, and Ali Al Khatib says the potential for who? So he talks about the same exact setup with the sensors and stuff that we're talking about, and says someday. You may have to work in an office where the lights are carefully programmed and tested by your employer to hack your body's natural production of melatonin through the use of blue light, eking out every drop of energy you have while you're on the clock, leaving you physically and emotionally drained when you leave work. Your eye movements may someday come under the scrutiny of algorithms unknown to you that classifies you on dimensions such as narcissism and psychopathy determining your career and indeed your life prospects. So Ali is not, his vision of the future of this highly censored network office is not as um, happy and, you know, uh, butterflies as, as James's, right? Ali Al-Khatib is, um, is also in the same department. Um, he was a, a, an HCI uh, student and he's an Iraqi American. And so Ali is very much used to persecution and he's very much used to his environment not being at his disposal. So his view of what's gonna happen with this technology is, is very different. And so this point of, you know, someday you might come under the scrutiny of algorithms unknown to you that classifies you on dimensions such as narcissism and psychopathy, determining your career and indeed your life prospects. I mean, this is not someday, right? This is happening right now. So there's a number of examples here. One example is Faceception, uh, which is a technology startup. And Faceception is um, advertising their capabilities to potential employers, right? Large companies or other agencies. 
And here is what they say. They say that you have that, that, that basically through someone's images. So you took look at just my, my, my photo. They can tell you whether I have a high IQ or not whether I'm, I'm uh, more likely to be a white collar offender or not, whether I'm more likely to be a terrorist or not, uh, et cetera. Um, so I call this racism. I mean, there's a very specific, there's, there's a very clear, uh, it's, it's stereotyping people, right? Computer vision is not magic. It, it doesn't just like magically tell you whether someone's inner, <laughs> you know, in, in, what inner intentions are, right? So a lot of times we have to, Data-driven systems are many times they can be used to advance the worst aspects of society at the day. This has ha been happening for a long time. And I write about it in a book chapter for Oxford Handbook of AI Ethics on Race and Gender. Um, like that history of using scientists, using data-driven systems to advance the worst aspects of society. For instance, um, Charles Darwin wrote about you know, how women's skulls are smaller than men's and therefore women are, their brains haven't really advanced as much um, as men, etc. So even, you know, even sometimes I feel like this, you, using scientific methodology and words uh, and, and data-driven systems can be even more dangerous because it gives the illusion of objectivity. And so in this case, um, there is so much to unpack here, right? So... For instance, high, uh, IQ, the IQ test itself and how it was created and what it's actually testing is, is a whole conversation to be had. And now not only are you, uh, are you taking this as a, as a valid thing to test um, employees with, but you're encoding it in a very, very widespread um, kind of model uh, that, that will now all incoming um, employees are going to go through and be processed. The, uh, the, the most successful sort of uh, version of this I've seen is um, HireVue. So HireVue is an employment company. And every single time I talk at this point, almost everybody has gone through HireVue. So I don't know. Oh, we already have a Q&A. So let me look at question. Oh, I, I don't speak German, though. So somebody should. Sorry, somebody should uh, translate the, um, the question Answer for me. that. It's just a question if you can uh, watch the video afterwards. Oh, okay. Never mind then. Okay. Um, so, um, so I wanted to ask people, I don't know if people can raise their hands or anything here, uh, if I can look at the attendees. Has anybody, do you know of HireVue? Has anybody gone through a, an interview process for a job with HireVue? So I'm very curious to see. Can you raise your hand if um, if you have, or can you just write in the chat if that's easier? So if you've gone through an interview process with HireVue, I'd really like to know. Never. Good. Okay. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> okay. So if someone has, uh, if 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 your answer is a yes, we'd like to hear from you. But. A lot of times it's so interesting. So yes, you're still a university student, but I, I, I talk to a lot of university students and they've gone through HireVue for internships, for example. And then I ask them, so what happens with HireVue is that um, what they do is instead of um, when you apply for a job, um, in, 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 instead of having recruiters looked, look at many resumes, uh, by hand and then decide who's gonna who should be hired for you know invited for an interview they um, have automated uh, tools to sit, to go through the resumes and determine who should be invited for an interview and then once you're having an interview they record you and, and I, I'm learning so many things from the people from the people who are uh, participating in this and learning so many things they record you and um, so they used to, they advertise saying, you, you can even look at the picture, saying that, oh, as you are, so they have these um, recorded questions that they ask you. And as, they're, as you're answering these recorded questions, they're performing emotion detection on you. And God knows, I mean, we don't know what kind of information they're trying to extract from this emotion detection uh, model and then what, they what information they send to the potential employer, right? But they say it's verbal and nonverbal cues. That's what they uh, advertise to the potential employer. And so a lot of people say like these are there's kind of they make the whole experience pretty terrible. First of all, they don't even know that there's been emotion detection 
that's being, you know, that's analyzing their faces at their, as they're talking. Secondly, they have these like short questions that are, deter that are supposed to determine your personality. So already these types of, you know, psychoanalytical kind of things are already problematic, right? And now they're encoding it into these like widespread algorithms. I mean, higher view is used all over the world by literally every sector from the government to many large companies to screen out employees. And so some of that, so I went, I, I, I gave a similar talk before and I asked some people in the audience, like, have you gone through a higher view? And, and can you tell us what your experience was? And some people were saying, for example, they were asked questions like, you know, uh, let's say hypothetically, you know, you were taking an exam and you saw someone cheating. How would you react? Right. And so this is already it's a, it's, it's just like a strange question, right, because it's trying to determine what kind of personality you have. And then while you were answering this question, you're also having this this weird, you know, emotion detection type thing on your, you know, be analyzing you. And then people already are sharing tips with each other, being like, um, yeah, I was told that it's good to smile more when you're doing this interview. So now, you know, it's not like women haven't been told to smile more like all the time, but now now this is this is basically what we're we're encoding in our, our algorithms, right? Like that that we should smile more. And so I worry very very much about something like this because um first of all, we we do not know there is no transparency as to what information they are uh, take trying to glean from you and what information they're sending to the potential employer. Um, there is no information about what kind of glitch this thing has or not, right? What if it's automatically assuming that I'm angry when I'm not? And so I, now that um, this is going to be a single point of failure for any potential job that I can get anywhere, um, it's not just that, but like the, the, the encoding of these psychoanalytic questions, assuming that, you know, someone can tell who you are, what your personality is from these kinds of questions. But, but higher view is an extremely, it's grown so, so big since I first started talking about this company like years ago. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that at least there will be some more transparency here. Um, another example of, uh, face-related uh, technology, automated facial analysis tool related, uh, automated and facial analysis related technology that is very heavily used, at least in the US, is in face surveillance. And um, so, for example, there was this article about Maryland's, so um, East Coast state um, of um, Maryland's face recognition system. And it is, it's one of the most invasive in the country. And so, in 2016, I believe, um, during the Freddie Gray marches, so Freddie Gray was yet another unarmed black person that was shot by police. And so there were these um, marches um, uh, when that happened. And um, so what police did is that they would use face surveillance on protesters, and then they would um, use face recognition, right? And they would try to match protesters with social media profiles. So they would then go to try to find these people on social media online. And so then once they targeted these people on social media, they would then look for those who might have um, unrelated warrants so that they could go further target them. So this is clearly intimidation. This is clearly trying to uh, prevent people from performing a civic duty, which is protesting. So most recently, during the Black Lives Matter protests, um, a lot of people were urging um, uh, people not to put pictures of protesters online on social media because they were saying, you know, this kind of stuff happens with police. And so then, um, oh, I wish I had it in my slides, um, this student, I believe her name is Sharon Zhao, um, it, it's pretty cool. She, it, it's, a, it's a cool... I think example of like flipping the, the technology, right? So she used um, face detection. So face detection is different from face recognition, right? Face detection just detects if there is a face somewhere and just says that's a face, that's a face. It doesn't tell you whose face it is. So she used face detection to um, localize the faces of protesters. So when if you want to put out an image uh, of, of protesters online, like a picture online, 
what she would do is she uh, she you could put it through her system that kind of you know uh, uh, obscures all of the faces first so that people wouldn't know uh, so that um, the police wouldn't be able to target the protesters. So I thought that was a good idea. Um, I have a number of questions already, so let me look. Uh, no sound. You, people can hear me, right? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, okay, good. Um, is it compulsory to inform the applicant what higher view is used? And if, if yes, what for? You know, the thing is, um, I don't, so the, the, the applicant knows that higher, the applicant knows that from what I understand, that they're being recorded, but the applicant does not know that there is any sort of um, emotion detection software analyzing their face or anything like that. So from all of the people I talked to, the only thing they knew was that they were being recorded. They didn't really know how what was being analyzed or how they were being analyzed afterwards, which is which is crazy to me, right? Like you have to at least inform people that this is what's happening. Um, so so my understanding is yes. Um, you know, so sort of, yes, people know that they're being recorded, but no, they don't know that all of all of this other stuff is happening. And we're not even sure what's happening. There are a number of um, friends of mine who are scholars who are trying to audit higher view, and they were saying they were even having a hard time being able to do that. So um, I, I, I like this, um, I mean, th this quote by Nimi Onuha, who said, you know, every data set involving people implies subjects and objects, those who collect and those who make up the collected. It's imperative to remember that on both sides we have human beings. And many times, at least in my field, um, you know, people forget that this is the case. They just sort of want to um, focus on the numbers or the algorithms or whatever, and they forget that it's actually people that we're discussing. The statistics and whatever we're doing, it's about people. Right. So um, one project I really like is called Our Data Body. So all of the thing that strikes me about all of um, the, the examples from before, think about higher view or faceception or something like that. They're always appealing to an entity that is more powerful. Right. So, you know, higher view is not advertising themselves to the potential employee. They're not like, hey, I'm helping you as an employee, as a person who's looking for a job to get a job. That's not how they market themselves. They market themselves to the employers, the potential employers who have a lot of money because they're the ones who are gonna give, you know, higher view their business, right? And so many times as a researcher, I also find myself doing that. Whether it's in academia or industry, you're always sort of, um, packaging your research in a way that appeals to an entity with higher, with more power than you, because you're either trying to get grant money or you're trying to get your paper accepted to a conference. And so there are reviewers. You're really usually not in a position where you're trying to appeal or win over people in marginalized um, positions. And one of the few projects I know that actually is working primarily with people in marginalized groups is this um, project called Our Data Bodies, Our Data Bodies Project. Um, and one of the people in, in, involved in that project is Sita Peña, who is a social scientist. So she's a professor, uh, I guess, um, in London, not the London School of Economics, from what I understand. And um, she gave this keynote at uh, a workshop called Tours Trustworthy Machine Learning, um, which, I, which was a very well done workshop. And this is, um, at a, at a conference called iClear, it's, it's a machine learning conference. And she said, the problem with abstraction, um, I have heard computer scientists present their research in relation to real world problems as if computer scientists and their research is not done in the real world. I listened to papers that tended to disappear people into mathematical equations. Marginalized people are demonized and deprived. What is the point of making data driven systems fairer if they're going to make institutions colder and more punitive. So I, um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this point because um, in terms of the academic community, um, this point of 
making data-driven systems fairer is really what they're focused on uh, with oftentimes without thinking about how this system that they're working to make fairer interacts with the rest of the uh, society. So one example here is my own work. So, um, so Joy Bulamini, um, who, well, when I met her, was a master's student at um, MIT at the time. And I uh, wrote this paper, which is um, basically based on her master's thesis at MIT. So I advised her on, on her master's thesis. And so what we showed was, um, so first, Joy was working um, with open source computer uh, vision software that are supposed to detect her face or detect her smile or something like that just randomly. And so she found that when um, that they wouldn't detect her face, but they would detect, you know, uh, her roommate's um, face or they would to detect her face if she puts in a white mask. And so she was already seeing there was something fishy going on there. And so what we wanted to do is do a more systematic analysis of some, some of these face related um, technologies. So we looked at um, three um, companies. Uh, uh, Microsoft, Face Plus, Plus, and IBM. And we looked at, in this paper, we wrote about gender recognition systems. What do these systems do? They look at a face, they take a face, and they assign a gender for it. So I'm gonna talk about this in more detail because one might ask, why should you even, why would you even create such a system? Why would you even do this? And so this is the kind of question that a lot of fairness works, I feel, miss. Um, and so they assign a gender to the system, and this gender is um, is binary. So as in, like, that's e either male or female. So you're already just making all sorts of assumptions about the world. Um, you're making an assumption that you can look at a person's face and tell their gender. You're making an assumption that this gender is binary. You're making an assumption that the gender presentation does not change across culture or time, that is static. And you're making the assumption that it's okay to create technology that even does this, right? So that's one. And so then um, they, they, they assign this um, label, male or female. And, um, and if you flip a coin and just guess, um, if, if the, the accuracy would be like the error rate would be 50%. That would be chance, random chance. Um, and so we found that as you go darker and darker in skin tone, it um, the error rates approach random chance, right? So that means like the error rates for darker skin women are much higher for anybody else. Um, the error rates for lighter skin men are uh, much, you know, almost zero. So when this paper came out, um, you know, we when we were analyzing this work, we knew that you know we had a hunch for why this might be an issue because the a lot of you know, there's a lot of works that were um, focused on automated facial analysis tools, and they had a lot of benchmarks. So there's these, you know, LFW, IJV-A, ADNs, etc. And when we were trying to do our analysis, we wanted to have a, a, we were looking, you know, we wanted to analyze these APIs by certain characteristics. And when we look at these data sets, we found that they were overwhelmingly lighter skin and overwhelmingly male. So we had to create our own data set. So we had a hunch that, um, you know, many of these um, tools use uh, images from the web um, in their training data and images and, and, the, and the Internet is heavily skewed whose images are represented on the web by age, by geography, by gender, by everything. Right. So so we had this hunch that you should diversify your data, your training data. So a lot of people after our work um, created these works that showed that um, a lot of data sets in computer vision were not representative of the world. So, for example, there is this computer um, vision data set called Coco that's very used, um, heavily used, and um, it's very popular in the um, research community. And they show that, you know, on the left is, you know, where the images for Coco come from. On the right is, you know, the population of the world, right? They're definitely not representative. Um, and then a lot of other works show how some of these biases that you see in data sets can get further amplified. Um, in the models, um, and uh, for and then this work, for example, shows that um, 
they do they look at different APIs, um, object recognition APIs, so Azure, Google, Amazon, Clarify, et cetera, and how they work at different places. Right here, this is from Nepal, and the ground truth is soap, but um, this is soap, but it's actually classified as like food or cheese. Whereas in the UK, this is the ground truth is soap, and it's correctly sort of classified as something related to um, the toilet or a sink or something. Similarly, here you see spices in the Philippines, and they're not, you know, they're classified as like some not spices, right, or condiments. Whereas condiments in the USA are classified correctly. So, so you see this kind of skew based on because of the training data where object recognition does not work um, well in many different locations. And similarly, here you see that you know we've encoded this um, heteronormative Western notion of a couple, um, right? And so here you see. Um, all of these images being kind of um, correctly classified as like a wedding or some sort of ceremony, except for the image all the way on the right. So, um, so this kind of issue is not unique to AI, right? So um, there were, for example, when um, seat belts were being developed in cars, um, they were doing um, tests on um, on dummies, these dummies that had stereotypically adult male characteristics. So it turned out that a lot of cars were, um, car, car accidents were um, causing, a, a, you know, they were killing, disproportionately killing women and children, right? Um, and similarly, cl clinical trials also, I mean, drugs also have a huge history, right, where there is, you know, exploitative testing that's being that's done on marginalized communities, but then on the other end of the spectrum, there are a lot of drugs that are not tested on people from uh, different groups. Um, so that, like, for example, eight out of the ten drugs that were pulled out of the market in late 90s or early 2000s or something disproportionately affected women. And um, right now, a lot of people working in personalized drugs or some and things like that are worried because less than 1% of the genes that are used for these kinds of studies come from the African continent. And even though Africa has the most diverse gene pool in the world, um, it's only represented in less than 1% of, of these studies. So imagine the next generation drugs and things like that that are not going to work for a, a huge segment of the population. Not only that, but they, their findings might overfit because they don't include um, a, a huge uh, portion of the world. But, but so my issue, my worry, I'm happy that this field has moved in a direction that's analyzing, um, you know, data set bias, diver, you know, fairness, um, uh, parity uh, among different groups and stuff. But the issue is, I think there's a tendency to just stop there. And um, that can be harmful because we cannot ignore social and structural problems. And visibility is not necessarily inclusion. What do I mean by that? So when uh, we came up with this paper, Gender Shades Life, that I mentioned earlier with Joy, a number of people reacted in a number of ways, right? Um, so for example, IBM created this diversity in faces data set. So what they thought was, you know, we can have a huge data set of diverse faces so that when you, when you generate your algorithms, then you can test how well it works on different groups of people. But the issue was um, um, this data set was um, cons consisted of pictures from Flickr. Um, and, you know, when people put out pictures on Flickr, and, and the, the licensing might allow you to do this, but when people put out pictures of their kids and themselves and whatever to share on Flickr, they weren't thinking that it was going to be used, you know, for face automated facial analysis tool related um, tasks, right, and models. So they had to take it down. And in fact, there was a lawsuit related to this. And then Google um, and many others got the memo that oh, okay, so our training data sets are not representative. We have to go get, you know, images of, for example, darker skinned people because the darker skinned people are not, represent, are not represented in these data sets. But then they were using a contractor which was using dubious ta tactics to collect more images of people um, who, who have darker skin, right? And then Microsoft um, was saying, hey, um, uh, Here's a blog post. Uh, we improved the gender recognition system. Uh, we don't have the disparities in, in error rates that um, that were shown by the paper gender shapes anymore. We, it now works equally well for everybody. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then other people were like, "What? Hey, you know, 
uh, people in the trans community are not re well represented in this in this um, gender recognition system. So we need to have them more in the we need to diversify our training data, and so we need to have them more in this data. And so they were just grabbing YouTube videos of people from the trans community without their consent. Um, so many of these um, kind of missed like a pretty big um, concept, which is should a task even exist? Should an automated, automated gender recognition system based on someone's face even be a task? And there are many people who've written um, papers saying, no, this should not even be a task, right? And so there's, uh, I've, I've noted some papers here talking about um, some of the potential harms of automatic gender rec recognition systems. So in their rush to make everything you know, work equally well for everybody. Uh, we didn't even take a step back, saying this should this model, should this API even exist. So I'm at least at Google. I was happy that you know there isn't an automated gender recognition, um, general purpose automated re gender recognition API that someone can use. Um, so once again, you know, it's not just about making things, you know, diversifying your data sets and making things work equally well well across um, different tasks. You should First ask, should this task even exist? Um, and usually you might not know the answer, but there are many people for whom a particular task negatively impacts them who will immediately be like, yeah, no, you know? Um, and then sometimes there are dual use case scenarios that have to be addressed as well. Secondly, when you need to diversify your data set, it has to be, there are many complexities there, right? You, there, there are a lot of, issues of consent, there are issues of power dynamics, et cetera, that have to be thought of. Um, I don't have to, I'm not gonna go through that. And so uh, a lot of people ask me, um, you know, why, why I'm concerned about face recognition, right? So here, here's an example um, where, again, people are trying to diversify their data sets, right? So um, China has a huge face, that, face um, surveillance network and they need to have images from African faces and so they're going to Zimbabwe, but I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure that the Zimbabwean public is not really benefiting from this, from their faces being harvested. Um, here in the U.S., um, one in two American adults is an uh, an unregulated law enforcement face recognition network, um, and so law enforcement can just use this face recognition network however they want. Um, and we don't even know what type of um, accuracies they have. I showed you some disparities that we showed earlier. And this was a, a, um, a report from 2016. And it, most recently, the same people had a report in 2019 showing how like these systems were being misused. So for example, if they had a suspect of a, a crime or something like that, they would say, oh, I don't have the picture of the, the suspect, but you know, um, he, I think he looks like Woody Harrison, who is a famous actor. So let's just take a picture of Woody Harrison from online and Photoshop his eyes or something like that so that we can then like, you know, put it into the system of nearest neighbors. And then, you know, that will give us um, images of people who look most like him and then we can go pursue them. And that's a clear violation of people's rights um, and using a system in a way in which, um, it was not intended to be used. So um, it, my, my colleague, Unso Jo, who is a historian, uh, was giving me this example um, on face surveillance. You know, So like I said, when people ask me why I'm, why I'm worried about face surveillance, because you know it's not so clear. I understand, I, I even wasn't as worried about it before because it's not like a bomb, it's clearly, you know, created to just harm people or a gun is clearly created to kill somebody. So it's, it's clear why that would be a bad thing. But you can argue, you know, face surveillance, it's, it's not so clear, right? Because people recognize faces. You're, it's not like you're, you know, you're doing something besides recognizing faces. And so why is it, why is it so, you know, problematic? Why do people think about this so much? And so the thing for me is, Technology just amplifies people's intents. So it's always how we use it and what we use it for. Um, you know, people can recognize faces, but they can't recognize six billion faces, right? And people can't remember and track all of these different faces. It's a matter of what you can do when you have this kind of capability. 
And uh, Uso gave me this example in the 1940s in the US. And this, this was from a magazine called Life Magazine. And they were trying to um, teach people how to distinguish between Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans. Why? Uh, Japanese Americans were going to be persecuted. So they're like, don't persecute Chinese Americans, but you need to persecute Japanese Americans. So here is how you um, can distinguish between these two groups of people. Now with face surveillance, this is being done at scale, right? So people, if they can't, if they can't, so there's the one aspect that we talked about, which is um, disparities in arrays not working well, but it doesn't mean that if this thing works perfectly well on everybody, that it's also just fine, right? Like if you are able to distinguish between different ethnicities because of their features, um, and then you do this at scale, then now it allows you to massively target them in an automated um, manner. Um, in the US, um, so now Amazon has, um, I would say, I believe uh, have a, has, has a one year moratorium on selling face recognition to uh, law enforcement. So it's called a recognition to law enforcement. But um, when, um, you know, so you have the, um, this, th this is an example of, um, uh, an, an article about um, Amazon's face recognition system. So one asks, one has to ask, you know, who are the people developing this, and who are the people that are rec the recipients of this technology? That are that are the recipients of the negative consequences of this technology. And many times, there really isn't an intersection, right? So here is um, a picture I took, not a picture I took, pictures someone else took, of a of a conference called iClear as International Conference and Learning Representation. And actually this conference was gonna be in Ethiopia this last year except for the pandemic. And so we were we lobbied really hard to bring it to Africa for the first time. We weren't able to do it. Uh, we were going to do it, um, but then the coronavirus pandemic hit so that it was virtually done instead. But if you look at this this um, makeup of people developing machine learning technology. I don't see any women, really. Uh, I don't see anybody, you know, who is from the, you know, demographic group that is persecuted by it, whether it is in China or in the United States. Every country usually has a group that's marginalized. And that group that's marginalized is not the one that is driving the technology creation process, but they're usually the ones that are at the receiving end of the negative consequences of this technology. So in this case, uh, a third person who also won the EFF Pioneer Award is Deborah Raji. So Deborah Raji and, um, uh, and Joy Bulanini wrote a follow-up paper showing that, um, and it wasn't even the main point of their paper, but they wrote a paper showing that um, Amazon's recognition system that they were selling to law enforcement at the time um, could have similar biases um, along skin type and gender um, as what as we showed in gender shape. So that Amazon's recognition system could have these types of biases, and that they should probably not they should stop selling it to law enforcement. The moment this paper came out, and so Deb was a, actually an undergrad at the time. VP after VP attacked them on, on, on social media, through blog posts, they hired a publicity up like a public firm, all that. They were extremely stressed out. And so um, Deb told me that before joining Black and AI, so that's a, a organization I co-founded with my uh, colleague Dredi Tapeba, she was going to drop out of the tech industry as a whole because she was going to groups like this um, she was facing a lot of isolation, a lot of discrimination, and she was going to drop out of the um, tech industry, but we're very lucky she didn't because she wrote paper, a paper like this that gets her attacked, and she is one of the few people who's willing to put her career and reputation on the line and, get, uh, and, and work on uh, research projects that help minimize the negative impacts of her, um, to her community. And so it's very important that people like her stay in the field. So for me, uh, work like Black and AI versus work like um, other research projects I work on 
I don't really differentiate as much between them because they're interrelated, right? You, one cannot really succeed without the other. And so in this case, um, Meg Mitchell and I, my co-lead, um, spent literally a month um, um, writing out a rebuttal, a point-by-point -point rebuttal to the uh, VPs who are attacking Joy and Depp. So Joy and Depp were really stressed out. They're like, we got to do something. We got to do something. And we were like, well, you know, we're not white men. We can't just go on Twitter and say something and it'll be fine. We have the one thing I have learned as a black woman is you have to be twice as you, you cannot give them any room for error. So we spent a whole month point by point, like writing out answers to their rebuttal. Um, like, and so what they were trying to do was say that there was a technically wrong, that they were technically wrong. So they were trying to attack the technical integrity of the work. And so we um, wrote out a whole a letter describing the technical integrity of the work, how it's accurate. And then we asked many, many luminaries in the computer vision community and other community, including a, a Joshua Benjo, who is a Turing Award winner. He, he won the Turing Award the same year. Um, and then we asked them to sign this letter and we put it out anonymously, uh, like, you know, an, an anonymously, but like a, a bunch of signatories. And then it was covered by all of like a lot of newspapers. And so then they couldn't really attack them anymore because it was a very well um, argued um, paper, uh, work, you know, letter talking about how this work um, should not be um, ignored or attacked. So, you know, it, um, it takes a lot to make sure that your research is impactful. It's not just about writing papers, right? Like, so here, Joy had um, coded bias, uh, which Nakima just talked about, and I highly encourage you all to watch it if you, oh, I think the release outside of the US might not be there yet. But um, there is, you know, a documentary um, that was created, um, but, and, you know, a lot of activism that we do, but it comes at a cost. So, um, you know, I'm primarily a scientist. But a lot of other scientists, um, they do try to minimize my work sometimes. So El Mahdi, who is a, a professor now at Ecole Polytechnique in, in, in Paris, he's about to be a professor there. He was talking about this thing called the Carl Sagan effect. Um, and so he was telling me about it and he, that he has um, noticed this about me where when he talks about my work or something like that, a lot of people describe me as an activist rather than a scientist, right? And he was like, well, activism, it's not that activism is bad. It's a, it's a noble thing. It's a great thing to do, you, have, you know? But he was noticing that how they, the way they, doc, the way they described me as an activist was not in the most complimentary manner. So he gave the example of, you know, he's Moroccan and there are a number of Moroccan um, uh, journalists who, who are targeted by the government. And he said, when people try to target the journalists, the journalists they target, they call them activists. They don't call them journalists. So then it's a way for you to, kind of di distinguish between the people who are doing journalism versus not journalism. And this has happened to me many times. I remember I gave a talk at Caltech and one of the most prominent people in computer vision, uh, we had a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, like an, uh, you know, just like a meeting afterwards. And he was like, so in your talk, you were just weaving in and out of science and activism. You know, you were weaving in and out of that. And and part of your talk was about science, but part of your talk was about how you think the world should be. And I was trying to explain to him, you can't separate those two. As a scientist, you are always bringing your view of how the world should be into your science. So feminist scholars have, um, have critiqued this uh, illusion of objectivity that comes from science, right? It's called the view from nowhere. A lot of scientists act like they're working from a view from nowhere. Whereas standpoint theory is a completely different um, theory. It says your, what your, your work is always comes from your standpoint as a, someone who's um, experienced certain things, as someone who comes who views the world in a certain way. Assuming or pretending that that is not the case is pretty harmful because it doesn't allow you to, to see how your standpoint in the world is affecting your, your work and your views. And this is, this, this, in my opinion, this view from nowhere type of ideology is one of the most harmful things that permeates science and engineering. And it's one of the reasons that we have all of the issues that we have today. Um, and so because of this, um, the thing that happened now, that's happening now that didn't happen five years ago is a lot of people are now talking about, like I said, fairness, bias, 
um, ethics. Um, people are talking about how we need to have ethics boards and um, you know, ethics codes and all that. But if people come from the point of, you know, the view from nowhere and I assume that having an ethics board is going to solve everything, it's not. Because if your ethics board is composed of all the privileged people and all the people who are not negatively impacted by technology, then, you're at the, then your ethics board is going to perpetuate your view, right, of what, what is right and what's wrong. And that's not fixing the problem. But that's happening in Silicon Valley a lot right now. You know, there's all of these ethics boards and ethics things that are not incorporating um, positions from marginalized communities. But um, there's interesting stuff that's happening too, right? So um, Sita Pena, who I mentioned earlier, talks about the, the notion of refusal. So, you know, it's not just about fairness or parity or whatever. Sometimes, you know, people refuse to engage with technology that they find to be harmful to them. And so um, this, this, these are some examples of that, right? So people are coming up with interesting fashion, um, interesting makeup to full face recognition systems so that they don't, you know, recognize them. So I've seen many examples of this. One of them was in Russia where uh, some activists were, uh, protesters were walking around um, uh, with, with some of this makeup and, you know, the police were sort of trying to low key, like um, recognize them, but then they couldn't. And so then they stopped them and tried to understand what they were doing. So, so, you know, people always come up with very interesting kind of um, solutions um, against what they believe is uh, oppressive technology. And that is all I have for you today. And I'm happy to take um, questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, wait, did I not share my screen this whole time? You did. You did. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you did. And there are a few questions, so um, no okay, worries. Let me, let me stop sharing my screen. I'm like, uh. I killed you. Uh, I can't. Oh, stop. I, I don't know how to. Why am I not? Um, so okay, we're, did I? Okay, good. Yeah, good. so we're good and we have a couple questions. Um, the first one in the Q&A is a little bit more complex. So I'll oh. give you time to read if you'd like. Um, um, okay, so I see, uh, do you know by chance if HireVue is also learning anyway from the interviews it's used for? Honestly, I mean, probably, I don't know. I don't feel, they're, they're, that's the other issue. It's like, they're not giving us I don't feel like they're giving us um, any information, you know, uh, about like I don't think they're giving us any information about how they're using what their what their training data is. They're not required to. They're not giving us any information about how they're using it. I mean, maybe in countries like Germany where GDPR is applying, um, you know, then they have to. Then they're required to to. Um, ask people if it's okay for them to use their data and they're required to, um, for people to, uh, if people don't want their data to be used for them to like uh, have a way to get, to get it out. But, um, but in the U S I really have no idea. Um, and then, okay. What do you think about the work of, oh man. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah, the um, Cambridge, uh, oh my God. Yeah, that work was just, so this page, so I had another paper uh, on uh, Google Street View and everything. And then my co-author on that paper worked with Michael Kaczynski on this Gadar paper, people call it a Gadar paper. And I emailed my co-author and I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> why, why? I mean, so, you know, because he's a student, right? So I, I, I hold the professors much more uh, responsible than the students because as a student, sometimes you're not thinking straight. Like you're, you're thinking, okay, I have to, you know, I need my visa. So he's on a visa. Right? I need my visa. I have to get my PhD or whatever. I need my letters for this, this, this. I need to write this paper with this, you know, prestigious professor. I need to do this and that. That's how you're thinking, right? So this is one way in which I really think, they, you know, again, writing things about it in a way um, that makes data driven systems that like they can do more than what they can 
is so dangerous. So um, there's just so many things that that he that that they did that I think are so dangerous. One was assuming that you can just tell whether someone is gay or not from their face. That assumption, um, and because you know they use profile photos on uh, social media networks and stuff. And so someone, the way someone presents themselves, maybe from that you can tell, but just assuming. And then they, they then he says things about, I remember like reading parts of it when I was just like, oh my God, things about how they find like some people to be a little bit darker or something like that. And how this gives um, cre credence to like some hormonal theories or whatever. And I'm just like, how how are you jumping from this where you're looking at profile photos to this other um, <laughs> uh, just conclusion, right? So so you need to pass the smell test first of all when you're when you're working on this kind of stuff. The other um, thing is that he was saying that he wrote this out of concern for the um, pe for people in that community. Uh, but like I and, and, and it was interesting because there was a split. I saw some organizations supporting him. I don't remember if it was GLAD, but like there were some organizations that supported him um, and then many others which didn't, which was surprising. So he was saying, well, the reason I wrote this is because I wanted to raise awareness that this could be done. But I don't know if anybody ever thought being like, hey, I'm a homophobic country. Let me like perform, you know, let me see if I can use an automated tool to see if someone can be gay or not. What he did now is just cr give credibility, right? So like now I, I feel like there's just so much harm here because if people want to do this, they can say, hey, by the way, that paper said we can do this. So I'm just going to use this thing and I'm just going to accuse, you know, use this to, to accuse you. I mean, there's just so many um, issues with this work. So, yeah, I'm not a fan of this work. I'm definitely not a fan of this work at all. Michael uh, actually wanted to uh, have dinner with me or something at some one time, and I'm glad I didn't. I I just couldn't. I I, I don't know what to say. So um, it it's just not it's not okay in my opinion. So that's how I feel about that. Um, Two final questions. One, okay. One coming from me. One um, I think we'll wrap it up with is more about the future. Um, the question for me is whether or not you think uh, the greater risk with computer vision is the idea of unfairly targeting marginalized people using this kind of perpetual lineup through public surveillance or the gradual normalization of privacy violations, like what you referenced with the higher view software that's not disclosed. What really worries me is, is, well, I don't know if I have to choose, but the latter really worries me because there is a series of steps that we don't question that then just um, kind of percolate. So the first step is IQ is already issued, right? Or like all of these personality tests and all of that, they're already kind of, they're already, you know, barriers for uh, lar large groups of people. And so now we are just saying, oh, yeah, he, you know, here are these studies that have been shown to separate between people who are violent versus not, and these personality studies. And so now we're encoding them into these, these algorithms. And by the time that there's any sort of regulation or anything, they're already widespread. Higher views are already super widespread. And I have no idea, like, how many other things like this are happening right now in all of these different other domains. So that worries me a lot because it's, it's, it's this uh, combination of, you know, oh yeah, there's already a well-known methodology to do. It's already problematic to have interviews like that. Even at Google, they used to have these brain teasers, which, you know, that, that have nothing to do with your job. They just ask you some random questions, you know? And so they debunked this. So people found out finally that like, it just doesn't make any sense, right? And so you're just encoding these things into all part aspects of society. So that really worries me. And what worries me is that it's 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 not just a um, it within the within one country it it increases the divide between the haves and the have nots, but it also increases the divides between uh, countries that are wealthy and countries that are not. 
in many, many ways, right? It's also being used in, in, you know, to vet refugees and stuff. I mean, there's so many things that are happening in this, in this kind of space that I didn't even talk about. So that's really what worries me. Um, I see a couple of questions that if people have time, I can take some of them. Um, so what kind of future would I like to see for AI technologies? I think that, so Ruha Benjamin has a, a, a book called Race After Technology, where she, you know, talks about how we should imagine, we should, uh, our imagination should not be limited. We shouldn't assume that the way things are right now are the way things should be, right? So one of the things that I imagine is things that equalize power a little bit more rather than um, the opposite direction. So like when you think about cell phones, um, you know, and, and it's, I don't know how much of a difference it's making, but like all of these police killings, right? Many, many people were able to videotape them on their cell phones. But when you're in a position where um, only one side can do this and the other side ca can't, then it's incre increasing the power divide, right? So and if you're in a position where only the police can videotape people, but people can't videotape police, then that's a huge imbalance of power. But when they're both being able to video, so that's why some of the things that people have been showing on these police brutality, which in the black community in the US has been a thing everybody's known for decades upon decades upon decades, now a lot of people are video are being able to videotape some. So I'd like to see more technology that allows for that kind of equal, more equalization of power to happen. It, that's a pretty big ask, I think, because there's a lot of structures in place. A lot of it is about structures, right? A lot of it is about, I don't know, the capital pro, profit motive and, you know, what the checks and balances are and things like that. But that's sort of what I would like to see um, happen. So I'd like to think about, you know, what if as much money was put into trying to figure out eradicating poverty in the world as you know, war. So much money in the world is put into war. I mean, the military always in the US and in many places funds the biggest portions of technology um, research in whether it's university. And then if you're an industry, it's companies that try to make money. So what if we had, you know, like a lot of money put into trying to eradicate poverty or trying to eradicate like health disparities or something like that, then people would come up with a lot of imaginative ways to work on AI for those applications. Um, so this is the first time that Mara has heard about higher view and the current state of facial analysis and shocked. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, yes. And what real improvement science are these algorithms trying to detect anything about a person's personality or psychology based? Is there even any? So, yeah, I agree with you. A lot of it is just racist theory. Um, and I think there is some work on organizational psychology um, that tries to, to, to analyze his personality traits and stuff, but I don't know much about it. There's a lot of work on emotion detection and computer vision, which is to me is also iffy. Um, I, I like to differentiate between external things and internal things like sometimes if, if you know smile detection i think is okay i'm already smiling you can detect whether i'm smiling or not um but then if you want to detect whether i'm happy or not that's a problem because you know what does that <laughs> mean there's some and then with emotion detection itself a lot of biases have been shown in on how annotators label diff people of different races and and you know cultural contexts and stuff like that um I'm trying to learn a little bit more about how it's used and you know there might be a du dual use case scenarios there might be use case scenarios where things are you know ac more accurate than i think or not but in general i'm i'm a little oh the minute is frozen isn't she yes okay <clears throat> Let us ask her to stop the video and then see if she can um, start back up. Okay. 
Okay. I think we have only two more questions after that, or three. Let's see if we can get her back. That's a new Zoom classic, I would say. Um, let's see. That might be connection issue. Yeah, she might have to restart completely. I'll give it a few more seconds because I think she has until 10 after before we need to end. Um, ah, the internet connection is gone she says. So I think we're going to have to wrap up. Okay. All right. Well, um, I am going to thank everybody at this point for having participated. We appreciate all the questions. Um, we really appreciate all the fantastic turnout. And this will be available on the Heinrich Böll YouTube channel yes. um, at a later point. And um, thanks everyone for coming and uh, for paying attention until the end. So have a good night. And see you next year. And see you next year. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye.